Buenos dias. This is the beginning of our second day here in Madrid. We are up bright and early at the restaurant here at the hotel. We'll show you the spread that we've got here to eat before we head off for our day in Madrid. Well, if you're wondering how breakfast was, <laughs> you saw all the food piled high. And there is there a third plate? Yes, there is a third plate for both of us because we went back and got a little more fruit. Yes, we got more fruit and and uh got a little more bacon too because that bacon it may have been flimsy but it was incredibly flavorful and smoky and delicious but yeah we're stuffed on breakfast now so well, let's go sit in a bus and then let's walk off this food that we just ate got an egyptian temple here in the middle of madrid and it just so happens to be the temple of J Bod. D Bod. D Bod's temple. Oh, good old Dougie has his own temple in the middle of Madrid. How do they do that? This is the, the oldest building in the entirety of the city. Maybe the entirety of Spain. Let's see how close we get. So just over off to the side of the temple is this amazing view. I apologize for the trees of the city. And then over here, you can see the Royal Palace right there in the back. We'll be headed there, but this is a great shot of it from a distance, but you can see we're kind of up on hilltop to see the view that we're able to see right now. Where the Royal Palace is today, you can see that uh, Madrid is over a little hill and we have to see that Madrid was founded by the Moors, people from the north of Africa, from Morocco in the year 711 invade Spain and they arrived here in the 9th century. So when they arrived, they built where the royal palace is today, the fortress, the Arabian fortress, the Arabian Alcázar, right? And around this fortress it starts to grow up a place called Mayes. I thought y'all like to see that so theme the park, name, Mayes, middle of Madrid, of roller Madrid. coaster. Maybe some water. swings. You can drain the water from the tap in Madrid. It's really good. It's very nice. One of the best things in Madrid is the water. Don't worry about your stomach. We are not in Mexico. No problem. Okay? <laughs> All right. So you can see from here, you have a very nice view. The, the, the former fortress was where the royal palace is today. And you can see the west south of Madrid. This green forest, can you see the roller coaster, the amusement park, and the orange thing, this is the roller coaster. Well, all this uh, natural forest was a hunting place for the different kings. <coughs> we have animals in this area in the medieval times, even bears, brown bears. That's the reason why in the coral parts of Madrid we have a brown bird. And when the king, later I'm going to explain to you the history of Madrid, but when the king moved the capital from Toledo to Madrid, the king saw this area and he said, wow, what a nice area for hunting. I want it, this area for me. So he started to buy little by little all this area. So for many, many years, the natural forest of Madrid belonged to the royal family. Right now it's a public park for the, for the people of Madrid, for running, for bicycle, but for many, many years, we have to the royal family. Okay, and you can see also the mountains of Madrid, the Guadarrama Mountains. We have two ski resorts in Madrid. They're pretty easy, but well, better than nothing, right? So just one hour for a work of Madrid, it's possible to go to ski when we have snow, depending, depending on the year. Last year, well, it was open, but not for a long time, because we didn't have a lot of snow in Madrid last year. Two years ago, yes, we had it's an Egyptian temple. Why we have an Egyptian temple in Madrid? Because Egypt is quite far. But in, in 1960, Nubia started the construction of the Aswan Dam. 
for the construction of this Aswan Dam, a group of Egyptian temples supposed to be flooded by the water, supposed to be destroyed by the water. One of the countries who helped Egypt in the construction was Spain, right? And also the United States. And that's the reason why the Egyptian government decided to donate to Spain as a grateful present this little temple that otherwise supposed to be destroyed. So it was moved stone by stone from Egypt to Madrid. And in 1972 was finished and we started to have this Egyptian temple here. Another country was the United States and we have another temple very similar to this one in the Metropolitan Museum of New York because it came from the same place. There is another one in Torino and another one in Leiden, in Holland. All those temples that are quite similar came from the same place because otherwise it was supposed to be destroyed. Half 2,200 years old. So it's quite amazing to have such, a, such an old temple here in Madrid. have been restored many, many times because the climate here in Madrid is not the same like in Egypt. Hmm? But it's the devil temple. Beautiful as the other part of Gran Pia hmm? because uh, later you're going to see the, the oldest buildings of Gran Pia and are very nice because at the beginning of the 20th century when this street was developed so at the beginning of the 20th century the the architects built beautiful buildings with nice decoration but just here in this side after the civil war we didn't have a lot of money after the civil war so the buildings are quite simple we had a lot of decoration and this is the last part most of the cinema that you you are going to see here in Madrid, the movie that we watch normally used to be American movies. But in Spain we are very lazy and we dab into Spanish most of the movies. It's possible to find a cinema where you can watch the movie in original version with subtitles, but most of them are in Spanish. Normally it's choosing the same Spanish voice for the same American actor. We don't change uh, their voices in every single movie, we always use the same one. And sometimes two different American actors use the same Spanish voice. For example, Leonardo DiCaprio and Johnny Depp use the same Spanish voice. And Hathaway and Scarlett Johansson use the same Spanish voice, all right? This is the second part of Gran Vía. And this second part of Gran Vía we call it the American style of Gran Vía because a lot of architects who work in the construction of those buildings or were American uh, architects or try to imitate or to copy the American style of the buildings in Chicago built in the 30s. The vanilla color, the yellow color, uh, the pyramidal shape. Look on your left, Primark. This is the typical commercial area. Primark is a very famous uh, Irish company and it's very popular because it's very, very cheap. Very, very cheap. You can see H&M, you can see Sara, Mango, Stradivarius, Pull&Bear. So this is the typical, typical commercial area. On Sunday, everything is open. They open later. Instead of at 10, they open at 11, 30, 12, but everything will be open uh, on Sunday. I'm going to show you the so you've got a statue of, of Dr. Fleming here, the, one of the inventors of uh, penicillin, and very, very odd that they have a statue dedicated to him here because, what a picture here. Yeah, get Dougie J there. Then behind me, You've got Praise Las Ventas, which is the largest bullfighting arena in Madrid, the largest bullfighting arena in all of Spain, the second largest arena for bullfighting in the world, the largest one being in Mexico. Um, they said that this arena holds about 23,000 people and that some of the best bullfighters here in Madrid, the most famous ones, um, can earn about one to two million euros per fight. Okay, you can see 
here in the front of Las Ventas. Plaza de Toros, or Plaza of the Bulls. Now we are in the courtyard of the Royal Palace. This is that building that you saw from earlier this morning from the hilltop. Well, now we have made it here. So I believe we're gonna head in, get a little tour of the palace, see if I can film in there or not. So, show you guys what I can. This is the main entryway. So this is King Charles the Third, first king to live in the palace. They said that they called him Charles Dignos. He was king of Naples, Italy, and then came over here to be king. As we walk, just have a look at how low the stairs are. They're not high steps that you're having to climb up. And then up at the top here, that statue is of Charles IV, the son of Charles Big Nose that you saw in the previous video clip back here at the bottom of the stairs. Okay, so this bust is of King Philip V, who orchestrated the creation of this palace. Looks like his eyes are following me as I move, but he uh, ruled over Spain for 40 years. He was French never learned to speak Spanish the entire time um, and they say that he was bipolar and maybe a little schizophrenic um, they say that he thought he was a frog and would sometimes hop around the palace and thought that white clothes were poisoning him so he'd, he'd just go naked around the palace as well so very very charismatic individual to say the least and they said that this is a French style palace built by Italian architects because Philip's wife was Italian and wanted some Italian impact on the palace itself. All right, guys, this, I was just told, is the last room that I'm gonna be able to film in or take any pictures of. So I'll hopefully be able to remember some of the cool, important things from the rest of the tour and hop on and talk to y'all about later just show you guys one more room here. On All right, spot. we are done with our tour of the palace. You can see this beautiful shot in the background of the city. Um, yeah, just another view, kind of like you had of the hill this morning, but just came over here to the shade, off to the side, out here in the courtyard. Might be able to hear the bells going off in the background. Um, I don't know if it's significant of anything because it's about 11.45. Uh, so not in any particular time here, but wanted to talk about the palace to you guys and tell you what we saw and what we heard. Um, what's fascinating is uh, there's 2,008 rooms in that palace. We didn't go into all of them, but every room has like one singular purpose. So like there is a dressing room for the king. There is a breakfast room, a lunch room, a dinner room, like every single room is something and the dressing room was pretty fascinating to think about the fact that the king would come out and get dressed in front of the people every time he changed clothes so yeah there's that um the dining room was very elaborate the dining room table can hold 145 people um but probably the most interesting factoid that we got uh and that we saw was they used a lot of stucco in the building of um, a lot of the decorations in there. They made stucco look like marble and made stucco look like porcelain, uh, just to save on cost, uh, which you don't really think about royals doing that much. Um, and, and the stucco did such an incredible job of looking like marble. You wouldn't really know the difference. So uh, just incredible artistry 
and work within there. It was very, very, very cool to see all that. And we really just saw the king's side of things, but the queen has a matching side. And, you know, it's not just the royal family that lives there. It's the whole court. And it's all the servants of the king and all the separate servants of the queen. Uh, so everybody has quarters and a living area. Uh, so now that we're done with the palace, we've got a little bit of free time uh, to use for the gift shop and to use for folks to go to the bathroom and stuff like that. And then we meet back up with our tour directors and we'll see where we go from there. My Star Wars fans, nice huge Obi-Wan advertisement here on Grembia, which would be the Hollywood or uh, Broadway Street here in Madrid. Here we go. Like old D-Bahad and me coming to you live from a cafe on the square across from the Taco Bell, La Taco Bell Madrid. There's actually like 80 of them, so that's not the only one. But we are here at the uh, Gran Villa Square. Diddy, Diddy, can I get some beef stacks from Taco Bell? Yeah, they got, I don't know if y'all can see it, I'll zoom in, but yeah, they got two Euro beef stacks over at the Taco Bell. And and before we, before we came here, we did check out the McDonald's on the corner because I really had to know if they had a McCalamari sandwich. And um, you'll be sad to know that they do not have a McCalamari sandwich. They, they did have some other interesting things, but no McCalamari. So uh, we're sitting here enjoying the beautiful, beautiful weather. Uh, we are in the shade right now, so we may change our tune on how we feel about the weather once the sun hits us. We'll see. Uh, and then we'll show you our food here in a minute. Our stuff is starting to come out just a little bit. We got uh, some house-made chips they brought to us. And then part of my order, I ordered a uh, white chocolate drink. It's it's not a coffee, although, you know, you may seem that and it may sound very white girlish of me and get a white chocolate mocha or something like that, but it's just a straight white chocolate drink. And I was like, well, that'd be good for dessert. And of course it gets brought out first, um, but it, it does taste very, very good. It's nowhere near the consistency and the thickness of that chocolate that uh, was in the first video. If you guys watched that, where I had the chocolate con churro uh, yesterday. More of our food came out. We both got like a, a yogurt and I got a lemon Fanta as one is to do in Spain, something you can't get back home. So we got a choice of two fruit and the kind of like syrup in here. I think Doug got strawberry and syrup and he also got strawberries and apples in his. I got the strawberry syrup with kiwi and banana main course has come out now. We both got the pasta carbonara. Looks very, very good. We demolished our yogurts and that white chocolate drink is all gone too. And the chips are all gone. This has been a great meal so far. It's not just dancing, it's a mix. It's a type of music. And where did that music start? It started in Spain, mostly in the south of Spain. And basically it was a mix of the three cultures that were living for a long period of time together in Greece. Arabics, Muslims, Christians, and Jews. But as well, um, gypsies. Have you heard about gypsies? Do you know who yes, are gypsies? Yeah, yeah. What do you think about gypsies, by the way? Gypsies are cool. Yeah, okay, that's a good question. I like that. I like that because I have gypsy blood. Most of the time, the, the, the great people think that gypsies are thieves and you know, nomads, travelers, and everything. Well, gypsies come from uh, nord the northern part of India, from Rajasthan, and they are nomads. Actually, they came all over, all over India to different parts of the world. They came to east side, it's part of Europe. So what it is nowadays, Romania, Bulgaria, and so on. And part of them came all the way to Egypt, to the south of Europe. When they got to Spain, they said, "We are." from uh, the royal family of Egypt. We are Egyptian. I'm from Egyptian gypsy. Okay, that's why 
why they are named gypsies. Um, have you seen like volleyball, uh, music, like dancing and all that? There is a dancing called Kata in India that actually has the same rhythm, the same rhythm of some types of music. It is crazy when you play some flamenco music and you play Kata and they have uh, uh, an Indian dancer and a flamenco dancer who will be dancing at the same time. Same with different step, the same. Then flamenco, like I told you, started with the mix of those gypsies, Jews, the Muslims, and some Christians. But when and how? Basically, it was a people that was not totally accepted by the rest of the society. They were kind of like an upper tape, and they used to share their culture, and as well part of what is culture is music, right? So they used to celebrate life together. And that's how flamenco started. When you will listen sometimes people when they sing flamenco it's kinda of crazy because you go like oh if you go to for example Morocco and you will listen to the call into the praying times to the prayer, that's the same type of sound deep from your guts. Okay, that's the kind of singing that you're gonna be listening. Um for flamenco dancer, yes. And that's like the most visual part, you know, the dancing, the tapping. That some people say like, wow, tapping like in Irish, and like in Irish dancing, you know, there are lots of tapping. Is it uh, a learned dance, or is this invented as a way that when they dance it? Part of both. When we learned how to dance flamenco, you, you learned different types of flamenco. Because there are, I don't know, but at least 40 different types of flamenco. 40 different types of flamenco, meaning 40 different types of rhythms. You have some rhythms that will be more to a from celebrations, meaning uh, mm, fiesta like tango, bulería, alegría, en sevillanas, all that, all that is, that is celebrated, celebrated. Normally, when they finish a flamenco show, at the end of the flamenco show, uh, you have um, one of these kind of, of party type of flamenco, okay? In the middle of the show, normally what you have is something more deeper. Some people, uh, some people think about flamenco like a blues, okay? Because it's really deep, like I told you, it comes from your gut, and it's more just your arms. It's a little bit more, it's not just the strength of your legs, it's more the, the your body, the way that you express with your body, with your face. You will see that dancers, even if you don't know what they're talking about when they're singing, you feel what is going on. Okay, you can tell. Which, what are, do the lyrics talk about? A little bit of everything. Most of the lyrics in all over the world, what they talk about? Love, right? And that's what we're gonna see here today as well. Lots of love singing, but as well, each kind of flamenco, each type of flamenco comes from a different part of Andalusia in South. So for example, in my city, we dance something called alegris. Okay. Uh, that it will be, I don't wanna dance, I just wanna, it will be something like that. That will be alegrias, a little bit faster, will be bulerias, okay? If you have a tango, that's really easy. Not tango like Argentina, but tango from, the clapping is part. The clapping is part of the percussion. It's part of the rhythm, and that's why I recommend you not to clap until the end of the show. Okay, until the end, not the whole show, but until the end of each each performance. Why? Because normally you get like, oh, clap, and I'm gonna clap, but actually it's the way for the dancers to understand which rhythm they have to follow. It's like they can be playing any other instrument. This part of the clapping is part of the instrument. You have this type of clapping, which are the deaf clapping, as you can see it's totally different, and then you have the sound clapping. That is more when they dancing. When they are singing, it's, it's slower, because like that you can really feel and you can really listen to singing. I know there's a lot, but I want you to, when you see this show, you understand that it's part of our history, it's part of our culture, and it's not something that we just see on stage. Basically, it's something that we do celebrate. When we celebrate, like for example, if I will go to a wedding, I will dance for it. If I will, if I will celebrate my birthday, I will dance for with my friends. Okay, we sing for it. It's part 
Costa Courier, okay? Mostly in the south. And why do they have flamenco in Madrid? Well, it's the capital, and people from all over the world come here to see a good flamenco show. Some of the best flamenco singers, dancers come here, and Barcelona, actually, both cities, they have some of the best tablaos because this, what you're gonna, this stage that we're gonna be enjoying tonight is a tablao. Tablao is in a stage just for flamenco. Okay. So that's something. I was working with flamenco. I was living in, in a city in the south of Spain called Granada and I used to work with gypsies for five years. And they did, they do live there. It's like the biggest gypsy community in Europe and they live in caves. They do perform every single night and they do something called samba. So they have all these different types of flamenco, but as well just gypsy types of flamenco. And you know what happened to me? One day, they have a, they told me that they would have a private show, a private show for somebody who was really important. Uh, so I went there and the private show was from Michelle Obama. And the interpreter never met it on time and they needed somebody who would be able to speak English. And I was like, hey, hey. So I ended up being uh, the, the interpreter from Michelle Obama. She danced really well. She was saying to dance and she had a really nice video. And um, the director of the Flamenco Festival of the city was there. And they really liked how I managed everything and I ended up working with the Flamenco Festival of Granada for a few years. And then, uh, in amazing fiestas, parties of flamenco. What does a flamenco fiesta look like? A whole night. Basically, it would be from 10 p.m. until 7 in the morning. That's okay. A gypsy wedding. How long it takes a gypsy wedding? Three days of party. Three days of fiesta. Okay. So, all this for you to imagine that this is an, how we express ourselves. Okay. Sometimes I'm now in Panama when I need to feel at home, I play flamenco and I dance like crazy and I feel myself and I let it go. And it's a way for us to let go, to feel ourselves. Okay? So I hope you enjoy it. I hope this all helps you to really get into, into the show. Do you know you went to the you take a look at the decor. It's very Arabic. It's like southern Spain, the more type areas. Stage right up there. I don't know if I'm going to be able to film the show or not. I hope I can film some of it. We'll find out. But wanted to show you guys what this place looked like at least. The guys from Colorado. <laughs> after hearing all about flamenco. <laughs>
that little taste of the flamenco show there i just wanted to give you all a little bit of everybody and you got to see everybody at the end uh, so passionate so talented um those guys have to be in incredible shape to do that i know for a fact my legs don't move that quickly but that was such an awesome show now we're about to head off to dinner all right hey guys i've got elena here um because she told us after the show that each one of the dancers was doing a different style of flamenco so um, since you guys saw all three dancers doing their separate dances, I wanted to get her on here to talk about which style each one was doing. So the first girl, she was doing an Alegria, actually. It's a type of flamenco from my city, from Cadiz. The second girl was doing was dancing at Taranto, which is more in the arms and the movement of your upper part of the of the upper side of the body. And the guy dancing Bulleria. All right. Well, there you go, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so dinner tonight is a taberna, uh, la Espan or excuse me, El Española. And first we've got some empanadas, some beef and cheese empanadas. Yes, sorry, beef and cheese empanadas. I'm going to be told that a million and one times. We also have some bread. Bread is gone, sorry. Um, but they're saying that these are almost like... Hot pockets, they look like pizza rolls to me. But I'm sure they're good. And then we've got beef stew coming out. All right, so the empanadas were a hit, and we, we were told that they are actually tuna and cheese, and they don't taste fishy whatsoever. They are delicious. You never would have guessed in a million years that tuna is what's in there. Well, the main course has come out, and it looks incredible. A beef stew. Looks like there's carrots and peas. And some papas fritas. Really, really good. And here's dessert. Ice cream. This was the choice. Had this, or could have had that. Went with this instead. Another good dinner. So Doug and I earlier today, when we found out we were having beef stew for dinner, had the idea that a lot of kids probably aren't gonna like beef stew. And many of them probably won't eat a lot and will want something else. So we stumbled upon the sweet pirate while we were out getting lunch. And this has just about every kind of candy you could ever imagine in these barrels. So, we're going to dig in, let the kids get some candy. We're going to get some candy. It's going to be great. There's my stash, guys. Got a lot of sour gummy type stuff because that's what I love. Got some uh, chocolate balls, some white chocolate balls. Just tried to get a little bit of everything. I'll be digging into it soon. Good evening, everybody. That's the end of our day today, our second and final day uh, touring around Madrid. Tomorrow we have an early wake up call. We're getting up at 6 a.m. here tomorrow because we have got to go catch a train. We're going to ride a high speed train um, from here to Barcelona um, over on the other side of Spain. So that'll be a couple hours. Tomorrow's kind of going to be a travel day because of that. 
Uh, we're supposed to get there around lunchtime, have a walking tour, um, some more free time, and then we will uh, eat dinner and go to the hotel tomorrow night in Barcelona. Um, so I hope you enjoyed another day out in Madrid. Hope you guys liked watching the flamenco dancing, what you got to see and hear about that. That was so cool. Such a great experience there. Uh, cannot wait to get to tomorrow and see what Barcelona has to offer since I've never been. So again, fabulous day today. What's your why?